good afternoon and thank you for joining us. My name is Lee Montville from Springer Publishing Company. School Nurse Supply and Springer Publishing Company are pleased to present today's webinar, The Biggest Challenges for School Nurses Today, From Coronavirus to the Marginalized Child. In this webinar, award-winning school nurse and author Janice Lashavo will discuss the top issues facing school nurses today. She will provide valuable insights into topics like medicinal use of marijuana, school violence, and professional issues that are impacting a school nurse's life on a daily basis. During this webinar, if you have any questions you would like to ask Janice, then please submit them through the comments field. We have time for questions. We will have time for questions at the end of the presentation. In addition, Please note that School Nurse Supply has generously provided a special offer for you, which we will mention at the end of the webinar. Now I would like to provide some information about today's speaker. Janice Lashavo is an adjunct instructor at William Patterson University's Graduate Nursing Division and serves as a field supervisor for New Jer Jersey City University. He has over 25 years of experience as a school nurse, retiring from that position in 2007. Ms. Lashavo has received recognitions for excellence both in teaching and as a school nurse, including the New, Jer New Jersey City University's Distinguished Alumni Award, the Governor's Teacher of the Year Award, and the New Jersey Nurse of the Year Award. While working as a school nurse, she was responsible for participating in child study team meetings, teaching health classes, serving as a liaison for children's protect protective services, and conducting faculty in-service training. The third edition of her Fast Facts for the School Nurse book was published by Springer Publishing Company in August 2019 and is available for purchase from School Nurse Supply. Her newest book, School Nursing, The Essential Reference, will be published by Springer Publishing Company in fall 2020. And now I would like to introduce Janice Lashavo. Thank you, Lee, and welcome to our webinar. I so appreciate you all joining us today. I also would like to thank Springer Publishing and School Nurse Supply for giving me this wonderful opportunity to speak with you, my colleagues. I appreciate that your time is valuable, so please know that I am committed to keeping on schedule. My presentation this afternoon will take approximately 35 to 40 minutes, followed by a question and answer period for about 10 to 15 minutes. As there are over 2,000 of you registering that have registered for today, of course, it will not be possible to answer every question you may have now. However, as Lee mentioned, I will personally answer them through email after the webinar. Let's move on to the next slide. I know what you're thinking. This is exactly how many of you feel most days, sometimes even on a good day. You become overwhelmed and barely can manage the everyday needs of the student who comes to you for simple first aid. In addition, you have to make assessments for the child with a head injury a possible diabetic reaction, seizure disorders, anaphylaxis, plus trying to stay on top of the increasing demands of national and state requirements. Since passage of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act in 1975, our jobs have become even more complex. Once we welcome children with disabilities into the mainstream so they could learn in, quote, the least restrictive environment, our workload increased dramatically. These children frequently require medication and treatments during the school day, as well as carefully constructed individual, I'm sorry, individual uh, healthcare plans. Besides these daily responsibilities, there are three major growing concerns that seriously threaten our children today. Like me, I'm sure you attend as many educational programs as possible. In preparing for this presentation, I went back, referenced my notes from programs that I attended this past year. 
I have included information about each one of these areas later in my presentation. You might want to jot down what you believe to be the major issues facing children today and see if we are in sync. I believe that if COVID-19 were not a priority today, these are the issues we would continue to focus on. We cannot ignore them, nor the influence COVID-19 will have on our children already impacted with these issues. To do so would be to further delay any progress we have made. We need to meet COVID-19 head on, and in doing so, respect the fact that these other problems will not quietly disappear any more than COVID virus will. So in this very short period of time today, I would like to provide basic information on coronavirus and how these other major issues and our daily practice will be impacted. Hopefully, I can help you put all of this in perspective and offer some suggestions to make copying, coping a little bit easier. We'll move on to the third, the next slide. My objectives are simple and direct. School nurses have always played an important role in controlling the spread of disease. This is why we were originally placed in schools in 1902. When you can, read about our inspiring history if you have not done so already. You'll find an amazing story of women and wonderful role models. This is an ideal opportunity for us to reinforce the effectiveness of primary prevention versus intervention. Primary prevention involves education and is most effective. Intervention involves treatment, which our hospital colleagues right now must deal with. We'll talk about control measures, what we do and how we can do it even better. The coronavirus will put in perspective with other crises. Together, we will predict and plan what changes will be necessary when schools eventually do reopen. And lastly, each participant will be asked to examine their own many attributes in light of the overwhelming challenges ahead. Ask yourself, what inner resources do you have which will help you enhance your school nurse practice during these unprecedented times? Next slide. Clearly, I am no expert in infectious disease, so my information was taken from those who are. Unless otherwise cited, I reference the CDC, the World Health Organization, the New Jersey Department of Health. I have also found most helpful information put forth by our National and State School Nurses Association. They have been wonderful. Today, though, I offer my nursing perspectives for you to consider. Next slide. Life goes on and children's needs do not change. Today's school nurse does not have the luxury of being permitted to focus on just one issue at a time. The health office is always and always will be the heart of the school, and you will be expected to remain that constant, reliable comfort for all. Now's the time to plan for school reopening and the next phase of this disease. In the slides ahead, I will provide an overview of coronavirus, a reminder of other current health problems, and strategies to address the reopening of schools and what is predicted to be a possible second phase of this disease. Next slide. Right now, people are terrified. There's no past history to reference. Parents will be frightened to send children back to school and may scrutinize your work. They will want to know and have a right to know what you are doing to protect their child. Parents of the immune suppressed child will be especially worried. It is your job to reassure them. The disease is new. We have little control over what happens in the community. All we can control is how we react and influence those that we care for. My next slide, please. I would like to start by spending just a few minutes talking about the history of the coronavirus, control measures, which include education, social isolation, isolation, I'm sorry, sanitation, and how we can expect our school nursing practice to change. Next slide. The World Health Organization gave us the acronym in February. Corona refers to the image of the virus as it appears microscopically with pointed structures resembling a crown. 
Corona means crown in Spanish. Therefore, we have CO or Corona, VI for virus, D for disease, and 2019 is the year it was first identified. There are different theories as to where and how it originated. One such theory is that it started in a wet market in Wuhan, China. This is an open market where live animals are slaughtered and sold as well as a variety of other products. Another theory is that the disease may have come from a Chinese research lab accident. The Chinese equivalent of our CDC has an office close to the wet market. So it may have come from an infected worker or contaminated trash. At the time it was discovered, the lab was experimenting with deadly bat virus specimens. So they had collected them for study. And this was information I got from the Washington Post that I'm passing along to you. Next slide. The above pictures are of a Chinese wet market in Wuhan, China. Uh, just mention, I had assumed that Wuhan was a little village somewhere uh, in a very rural area. It is actually a large city, capital of one Providence. Um, it was shut down for 10 weeks. People are back moving about. And I believe the wet markets have been discontinued completely. But again, do not quote me. Next slide, please. How does COVID-19 differ from seasonal flu? Influenza is a human virus. And as such, we have some immunity from previous exposures or the vaccines that we receive and encourage everyone else to receive. COVID is a novel virus, which comes from animals. It mutated to humans and then transmitted from human to human. Some feel that the bat infected a pangolin, which is a scaly anteater. You see the picture right in front of you there. It is believed to be the vector. The scales are also dried and used as herbal remedies and the meat is considered a delicacy. Today, we know two strands of the virus have developed. Both are very, very serious. To the right is a microscopic picture of the virus as it colonizes. Those red dots represent the colonization that takes place within whatever organ the um, virus enters. Education, next slide, please. Education is what primary prevention is all about. It's the simplest and most cost effective. That's why we do, what we do is very, very important. Remember school nurses walk with one foot in nursing and the other in education. The COVID-19 virus is not a living organism, but a protein molecule with a fragile, thin outer layer of fat. And this was taken from John Hopkins University memo that I read. Hand washing and rubbing for 20 seconds cuts the fat and the protein molecule disperses and breaks down. So certainly covering coughs and avoiding touching the face is absolutely essential. No matter how knowledgeable you are, if you do not share that information, you're not helping your students. Newsletters, web pages, virtual meetings, do whatever works best in your school. No one will know how hard you are working to protect students unless you make it known. Social isolation, and I know you're all looking at that first uh, bullet underneath social isolation. Parents must keep ill children at home. We have always asked them to do so. Now it's imperative. Consider after school programs where students gather. They may need to curtail these after school activities, music, athletic events, and social events. There's even talk of staggering attendance at school. Consider ways you can also separate students who come to you with constitutional symptoms and those who might want to just come in and talk and visit or need a Band-Aid. This will be challenging. In the 20 years that I have done field observations, I have seen very few health offices with adequate space. Most schools were built with a health office adjacent to the main office in the main corridor, but many now because of overcrowding are classrooms or offices to accommodate child study team members or administrators. You must look for creative ways to separate the children. A student of mine made a great suggestion. She, I know she has a very tiny office. She set up a desk outside in her hallway where students who were not ill could just come grab the ice pack or the Band-Aid. And she only had in her office those children who exhibited temperature cough or something that was contagious. Remember, the more confined the space, 
the more concentrated the virus is. Best to be in open or well-vented atmosphere. Ventilate after disinfecting. Children have sensitivity to chemicals used in disinfectant solutions. We do not want to cause further problems for them. Next slide. Going forward, what can you do? Well, of course, you have to keep abreast of information as it's made public. Information changes by the hour, so it's really, it's really critical that you do so. Renew and update your standing orders. Check if return to school policy is adequate. I know when I, I had my school nurse practice, uh, 24 hours, if they were asymptomatic, they could return to school. We might want to reconsider that. Exclusion policy. Children came back with coughs unless they were febrile. I allowed them to return to school. Again, cough is a serious symptom. Um, what about returning to school? Do we need MD clearance before they come back? All of this has to be readdressed. Work on your health office to uh, make sure that there's adequate space to separate the ill from the well child. Be careful what sources you quote. Um, you uh, Certainly you rely on your school physician and re reputable sources, CDC, World Health Organization, et cetera, our nursing organizations as well. Some of you may have a full set of PPE or personal protective equipment from the days of hepatitis mandate or the Stop the Bleed initiative that we're seeing now. You certainly need masks and gloves to be available, but you should also have at least one full set of a face protector, uh, a bonnet, booties, a gown, so that should you have an, what you suspect to be an active case of COVID-19, you have proper protection for yourself. Keep staff and parents updated as you move along. Make sure you know what's going on in the community. If you have illness, a high level in the community, you will also have it within the school. Look at children who have chronic or immune suppressed conditions. I would, I would check on them as you move forward, as they're home, see that they're handling things well. And renew your HIPAA FERPA laws. Huge, this is a huge public health crisis, and there may have different criteria now. You don't know, and you certainly need to be aware. Okay, our next slide, please. School implications for us. Many students have less than ideal home situations. If they and if families have trouble coping with five or six hours of contact during a normal school day, the 24-7 will certainly not be better. They may be a change in their financial status. They may have illnesses, lost their jobs. Social, social isolation will only exacerbate these many, many problems. Okay, I would like to move on now and look at the first of three other health problems I mentioned earlier. Next slide. The opioid epidemic. In my introduction, I alluded to these other serious issues. The opioid epidemic is one we need to definitely revisit. Substance abuse remains a major health issue. In 2018, 67,000 people died from a drug overdose. 70% of them involved an opioid use. I have not seen the 2019 statistics yet. I would certainly love to, and I'm hoping that because of the introduction of Narcan, the emergency overdose treatment, that we see a significant drop in numbers. Um, and also the regulations involving physicians. They now have to, uh, they cannot order more than I think six pills at a time, and they are asked to caution patients about the addictive uh, propensity of opioids. And nicotine and alcohol are believed to be gateway drugs leading to illegal use. And some fear that marijuana might be as well. This is why there is so much concern. Right now, our recent law permits medicinal use of marijuana in 34 states. 11 of those states within the 34 also permit recreational use of marijuana. The 11 states that still that are now permitting recreational use are Alaska, California, Colorado, Illinois, Maine, Massachusetts, Michigan, Nevada, Oregon, Vermont, Washington State, and Washington, D.C. 
I have that, again, th those statistics are from the World Population Review. Next slide. Mar marijuana is extracted from the female part of the plant flowers, and there are two prevalent components. THC, tetrahydrocannabinol oil, is the primary proactive component and gives the high. CBD, or cannabis oil, is the cannabis liquid or oil extract. And there is some evidence that it may be useful for relieving severe pain, inflammation, nausea, and chronic conditions. Next slide. We have a major controversy regarding the use of marijuana. Federal law considers marijuana a Schedule I drug the same as heroin, LSD, and ecstasy. Schedule one drugs have high potential for abuse and dependency. No meta, and it's claimed that they have no medical use or value. The FDA approved marijuana use only for severe epilepsy and only in a liquid form. States counter by referencing the 10th Amendment, which was written in 1790 to protect states from excessive federal power. It says that powers not given to the national govern government by the Constitution are reserved to the states or to the people. Our founding fathers did not want a powerful central government. Today, most schools do not give herbal remedies or food supplements. They are not, these items are not controlled by the FDA. If marijuana is to be given, it must be only in liquid form. And if you have a student that meets that criteria, you must have a district policy in place. Next slide. School violence. The second area of concern is school violence and how we manage crises in schools. The situation is deemed a crisis when the need for help exceeds available resources. If a child falls off the monkey bars and fractures his clavicle, you call an ambulance. If a ceiling falls down on a class, you have a crisis, since much more help will be needed. No one will argue that children have the absolute right to a safe learning environment. We have known very dangerous times when decisions must be made quickly. Today, we have the Me Too movement regarding sexual violence and the student-led Enough is Enough initiative following the Parkland, Florida shootings. These schools will never fully recover. Violence is prevalent enough that many schools today have a police presence. Next slide. 71% of high schools have at least one armed law enforcement officer. I find that staggering. And I would like to think that if we had 71% of the schools with a school nurse present, we would not need the guns. Next, next slide. School, students depend on the school as a safe refuge. Many have close relationships with teachers, with guidance counselors, or with the school nurse. COVID-19 has caused significant stress since many homes now have one or no income. Unemployment is at a rate, at all-time high rate. It is anticipated that the socioeconomic gap will continue to grow, and we will see academic lag, especially for those who struggle anyway. Next slide. Okay, my third and last major concern is the marginalized child. The marginalized child is the one who remains on the outside of society and not permitted to join the other, functioning on the peripheral edge of society and giving us less importance than others. Several years ago, I held a conference on this topic and planned to title the conference, The Sad Child. I approached the keynote speaker and I tell you honestly, he refused unless I changed the name. He reminded me that these children were not innately sad. Society, us, we make them sad. Naturally, I changed the title to the marginalized child. We have made progress. We now have regulations to deal with bullying, very good state regulations. We've made needed advancements in acceptance of gay, transgender students, but much more needs to be done. To combat high suicide rate, we now have mental health first aid courses to help all people. 
obesity prejudice remains prevalent and that saddens me. Most children have a hard time getting away with a racial or ethnic slur, but it's still permitted to call someone a pat, fat pig and get away with it. Beware of the needs of the transient student also. Many will be moving due to a change in income level. These children have a tough time finding their place. Next slide. The, without school staff and intervention, the marginalized child can be marginalized even further. Let's remember that physical appearance alerts us to the child with a physical handicap. Somehow we're able to be kind and accepting to the wheelchair bound student. The child who's mentally ill may not look different. If they don't look different, they are expected not to act different. Those with emotional or psychiatric needs can easily be overlooked. Next slide. School implications for a marginalized child. These marginalized children have heightened vulnerability and rely on us for support. Children do not always verbalize their fears, but will seek out the school nurse when they perceive fear surrounding them. Now that we have discussed COVID-19 and my totally subjective three areas concern, opioid, marijuana use, school violence, and the marginal child, and I have totally depressed you, it's time to talk about you. Next slide, please. I have identified 10 of the most important attributes school nurses have, and I'd like to highlight just a few. I'd like to share a story with you first. Recently, I did an observation at a large urban high school. When I arrived, uh, always at any school, the first thing I do is introduce myself to the principal and ask if there's any problems I need to address. This principal, as most, assured me that the nurse was absolutely wonderful, but he was in desperate need of a substitute. He shared that he was able to get a sub when his nurse came in one day, much too ill to stay. The sub arrived around 9 a.m. By 9.30, she had put her coat back on and left, never to be seen again. The work was just too overwhelming. Clearly, ladies and gentlemen, not everybody can do what we do. I would like to focus on a few of these attributes, such as sense of humor, interpersonal skills, and professional pride. During these tough times, enhancing these will help guide you along. Next slide. Recognize that fate will, pre will frequently place you in situations much larger than you can completely understand. This is what we have today. This is one of those times when the issue at hand can leave you feeling insecure and poorly prepared to completely address and remedy. Be alert to these new challenges and receptive to the influence placed before you. Each event will create a better you, more confident, more capable. Your interpersonal skills will enhance with each interaction. Next slide. For the least last 10 years, I served as hospitality chair for our county organization. And I made an interesting observation that I'd like to share with you. Nurses would arrive for our meeting and this was the typical scenario. They take off their coats, put on their name tag, sign in, and then proceed to vent to me about a school incident. But what I noticed was that the nurses never complained about a student. Never did I hear a word about a student who required a lot of their time. The complaints always centered around administrators, teachers, parents, and it was always about some adults who had given them a difficult time. This saddens me greatly. I would like to give you, I, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the Gallup poll. So here are some interesting statistics. When you were challenged, remember these numbers, 19 professions, and guess what? Next slide, which is number 27. Nurses were ranked the most honest profession. I know you're not surprised. Next slide. For the 18th year in a row, and I'd like you to take just a moment. I know these numbers might be a little small for you, but look closely at the numbers. We're way on top. And I've just given you four years, but there's at least 20 points that separates us from the other professions. 
And I'd like to remind you too, nurses are also teachers and psychiatrists. And as school nurses, we represent the best of the best. That's your ammunition when an adult or a colleague gives you a hard time at school. Interpersonal skills, you, can, you cannot answer every question or fix every problem. I used to say, I, I, when people asked unrealistic things, I left my magic wand at home. You should not have to be put on that kind of spot where you are responsible for every answer. Next slide. Try, much of what we do is very, very upsetting. Try to find a sense of humor and laugh over things. Um, when you do, share it with, with others. Next slide, which I'm about to do right now. I'll tell you a very quick story. Um, you'll know, you, as you know, the little ones come with a buddy when they come to your office. I call that second person, the buddy, the attorney. It is their responsibility to speak for the injured child. This day, the attorney announced that he ate the whole can. And I said, what? String beans, spaghetti? What did you eat the whole can of? And this is what he ate and very proud to do so. So Janice spent the better part of the day on the phone with poison control. And then after school, I stopped and bought the teacher another can of cat food. What can you do? Number one, above all things, take care of yourself. Take opportunities to relax and unwind. Reach out to colleagues when you feel that you need to vent. They're the ones that understand you. Other adults do not. Many other teachers feel that unless you have 25 kids in front of you all day, you're not working. Leave your office for lunch. Walk outside. Know that we deal with many gray areas. You will be undecided about the correct course of action in a lot of situations, but you'll never make a mistake if what you do is the, in the best interest of the child. What do you do now at home? Well, Offer to help in any way you can, which I know many of you have done so already. You're making phone calls, you're volunteering all over the place. Plan your health office in service now. This is for the teachers. Give them lessons on how they are to handle children and what they can do preventive wise in their classroom. Coordinate with teachers with health, for health lessons for students online. Teachers are all teaching remotely these days throw in a health lesson there about hand washing and covering coughs. Speak with parents now to demonstrate concern and anticipate needs for when school does open. How are their children? What can you do to help them? Plan on how to triage once they do come back to school. Again, look at that office of yours. What can you do to make it better? In consulta consultation with your school physician, revisit those standing orders. Um, have them address specifically return to school, illness at home, um, when to exclude, cough, other symptoms. Remain non-judgmental and positive. Uh, and this is hard during so tough times because people want to blame others. Remember, put on your own oxygen mask first so you can take care of others. Next slide. Considerations when school does reopen, and I have no idea when this will be. Uh, some days I listen to the news and I feel, wow, things are moving along nicely. Other times it just seems more discouraging. Expect to be even busier. That's a given. That is a given. You will, on top of your normal craziness, you will be even more busy because of the issues that COVID has brought to us. Stay connected. Stay especially with your national and state organizations. They will guide you. They will, they will be your cheerleaders. Screen and educate everyone, including bus drivers, lunch staff, aides, custodian. And if screenings are mandated for teachers, do not forget these people. Check on the lunch distributions. That's where students congregate. All the lunch aids, masks, gloved, whatever they can to protect students. Are the areas clean sufficiently? When school activities do resume, keep on top of that. Make sure that no unnecessary congregating is done. Evaluate students and staff with underlying medical conditions, especially heart and lung. Look at your teachers that might be elderly and immune compromised. There is um, a self-checker on the CDC that 
that, that teachers can um, go through to make sure that they have no illness when they're coming to school. Remind them they're not being noble, good teachers by coming to school. You don't, do not want them there. They are to stay home as the child should. And again, touch, reach out to parents of children at risk. Let them know you care. Let them know that you'll be involved in caring for their child when they do return. Next slide. In summary, we know enough about immune response to know that the only way we can pre prevent a full resurgent of a disease is when a large number of uh, people are immune from having had the disease and built up a natural immunity or are vaccinated. Most health officials are saying that we are years off from an effective vaccine. So clearly we will not have an overnight return to normalcy. Restrictions may be lessened and then reinstated. So anticipating this, we know we're not going back to school this semester and we do not know about the fall. Rely on good sources, not hearsay. Help with the solutions, do not be part of the problem. That may mean not going down to the teacher's room for a while because teachers are going to be upset and angry. Continue to employ basic preventive strategies to reduce the spread of infection. Be mindful of other issues facing us, the ones I mentioned earlier. Keep that marginalized child close to you. Learn to live with challenges and find humor whenever possible. Recognize that while we work alone, we can stay connected with each other. Remember that school nurses are valued and respected and consider the child's needs first. Tasks must wait. And I'd like to just close with you um, a little demonstration. I'll have to describe it. I wish we could do it visually, but this is something that I always do the last night of my school nursing class for the first, my school nursing one class. Um, Imagine you are holding a clear plastic gallon container. It's hard, think of it as lucite or whatever. This represents the day. It cannot be lengthened, it cannot be expanded. You only have 24 hours. In it, pour five pounds of uncooked rice. Each grain of rice represents a task that you must do within that day. When you look at your container, you'll see that there's only a few inches of space at the top. Now, I assemble about 10, 15 small toy people, uh, play school, wee blows, that kind of size. And then one at a time, I add the small people on top of the rice. One of the child I explain is one with diabetes. One has asthma. One is mentally ill. The container will only be able to hold three or four of these little people. Then what I do is empty out the entire plastic jar, rice, people, everything. And I start again by putting all of my 10 little children in. And then I add the rice. And you will see for yourself, everything fits. The rice goes around underneath on the side. And on top, you'll even have a little bit of space. That space, that time is for you so that you can take care of yourself. So I would like to close by giving you my maxim. Always remember, children do not interrupt our work. They are our work. And I sincerely thank every one of you for joining me today. And a special thanks to Lee and um, Erica and Andrew who held my hand through this whole thing. Thank you most. And I look forward to your questions now. Thanks, Janice. Um, before we go to questions, we, would, we wanna let you all know that School Nurse Supply is offering a special gift today a free school nurse badge with the purchase of Janice's book today. And that, school, and that uh, school nurse badge will be personalized for you. All you need to do is mention the word webinar when ordering. There'll be a link to School Nurse Supplies site in the post webinar survey that will follow the end of this presentation. And we thank the team at School Nurse Supply for their support of school nurses and important resources like Janice's book. We go to the next slide. And finally, we want, we're excited to announce that this is the cover for Janice's new book, which will be coming out in fall 2020. It's School Nursing, The Essential Reference. And if you have any questions about it, please let us know. Now we'd like to get to some questions and you all have submitted a lot of questions. So we will try to get to as many as we can. Um, 
first we would like to start with Natalie inquired Janice about the following. Do you think that when schools reopen, will there be a recommendation to wear a mask? And if so, what as school nurses should we be aware of and how can we help best prepare our school communities for returning to school during and after a pandemic? How have other school systems in the US or other countries managed returning to school after a pandemic or epidemic? Well, first of all, um, if it's recommended to wear a mask, I would certainly wear a mask. And I would even take it further to say I would order a sufficient supply right now so you have them for whenever you do reopen. Um, I would err always on the side of caution, uh, maintain isolation in the health office as much as possible, the strategies that we just went over, separating the ill from the well child as best you can. I have no idea when we will be returning. Um, I wish I had a crystal ball and I could tell everyone. But um, I, would, I would suggest, besides following recommendations, use your own common sense when it comes to strategies. If you have a high level of illness in your community, it will be reflected in the school. So I am masking, I am gloving, and I am telling everyone that this is the safest way to go with it. Um, I would follow those recommend recommendations to a T. Was there any other part of that question, Lee? There were several parts. Did I address everything? I think you did. Um, yeah, I think you did. Um, the second question was from Constance. And Constance would like to know, is a school nurse able to administer FDA approved cannabis oil oral solutions to a student for treatment of seizures with a doctor's order? Okay, that's a little more involved question here. Um, my answer is yes, because as I said, I do believe that we do have um, medicinal um, approval from the FDA to uh, give uh, the liquid uh, cannibal, cannibal, cannabis oil to students. However, the first thing you have to do is check your state to make sure that you see this in writing. I know, and I can speak from New Jersey here, we do have um, a policy that permits it. New Jersey has passed the, uh, has approved medicinal use of marijuana, has not recreational, but there are provisions to it. It's given only for a seizure disorder or um, HIV, uh, a child with ALS, someone who's terminally ill, they are very, very strict. Um, students are not permitted to self-medicate. They cannot be inhaled. It can only be given in liquid form. It can only be given in the health office by the parent with the nurse present. So yes, if you're in a state that you do, um, that does permit um, med medical use of marijuana, absolutely, you can be part of it but the parent has to be the one primarily giving it according to, at least here in New Jersey. Some general cautions for everyone. When you are, get, if you are placed in this situation, and I do see it coming, I really do. Uh, proponents of marijuana for seizure disorders, they're really hot on this. They feel it's, it's done wonders for their children. Understand any kind of medication is a high risk area for nurses. We really don't want to give any meds unless we absolutely have to. So if you're put in this position where you are there with the parent giving the marijuana, I strongly suggest you have the policy written for the district that you may go ahead. You of course, you need the doctor's order. You also need a comprehensive IHP. And usually with our individualized healthcare plans, we evaluate at the end of the semester. I would not wait that long. I would evaluate every three months. Is it actually working? And before I started giving, allowing anything to be given on school premises, I would insist that that parent be giving it at home on a regular basis so you can anticipate any side effect at all and uh, alert the teacher so that they're prepared as well. That's great. Thank you, Janice. Um, the next question, a couple people asked uh, variations of this is, what do you suggest should be on the quote unquote list to go out to parents of when to keep your children home 
when school reopens. Okay. I, I see all my colleagues out there rolling their eyes because they are so frustrated with parents sending children into school sick. And I'm anticipating it will even be worse because parents now have to get back to work and they depend on school so much. Um, I liked sending out, I always did this in September, I would make my list of symptoms. I would tell parents that um, these are the things to look for, that now that we are getting back to school, that children, once they congregate, they always share their germs. These are the list of symptoms to be alert for. Elevated temperature, and you have to be specific here, temperature over 99, I would put, and that's without the use of any antipyretics. Um, I would put rashes, anything that um, was systemic that caused the child to be upset, uh, caused the child to be unable to focus on the classroom work. Um, the uh, sore throat, headaches, I would mention all of these things. I also, and this is a little side tip here, in September, I would also mention lice because if you send a little note out in the beginning of the school year that um, be alert for this, because most children come back from summer, summer camp with, with lice, um, to watch for that. Then if cases surface and parents want to know why didn't you send a notice out, well, you did. You did it in the beginning of the year. As far as coronavirus, I would just make it crystal clear, in addition to all these symptoms, that you, to protect the entire student body and your teachers will be sending children home more readily. And you will also be turning them away at the door first thing in the morning if they come into school sick. And again, have your, your um, standing orders updated so you have the school physician behind you when you send that child out with a cough and you make it clear that, look, this is what the school doctor wants as well. Great. There are several questions regarding um, PPE and masks and goggles. Right. Jean asked, should we wear a mask and goggles during respira respiratory treatments? I would, because that's the time that saliva is flowing there many cases, even as they put the mask on uh, to or the uh, tube, the uh, mouthpiece. Um, you're dealing with a very contaminated area under the best of circumstances. Kids are breeding ground for all kinds of germs, not, not, not just COVID-19. So I would protect myself now. Let's, I think we're all going to feel that we need to have this little extra bit of security, and it doesn't hurt. I would put it on and gloves as well. Great. Um, Karen asked, considering the risk of aerosolization aero so in the context of COVID, what is your opinion regarding nebulizing treatments in a small health office? Well, there again, you hopefully you're taking the well child, the one who it does not have any constitutional symptom, and separating them as much as possible. Nebulizer treatments have to be given. I mean, the they, children need them. Those who come in for them need them to stay in the school. In fact, now we're all required to have a nebulizer. I shouldn't say that. I don't know about out of New Jersey. But um, having a nebulizer is an important tool for our students. So we have to give them even though it's at risk, I would put them in as, as isolated place as possible um, and make sure when they're finished, you ventilate and disinfect. That's the best thing you can do. Great. There's a, Lillian asked the following, do you feel that everyone should have their temperature taken as they enter school as it is being done now? Um, well, I'm not aware of school, of, uh, I'm sorry, this here in New Jersey, New York, and that we're all closed here anyway. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's a bad idea. We have, we're reaching that high peak right now. I know it's time consuming, but they have these devices now that are very, very quick, these scan thermometers. I think it's well worth the investment, and I think that's a good idea to do. And don't forget the teachers as well. Victoria asked the following. I was wondering how best I can protect myself and my medically compromised students, i.e. cerebral policy, epilepsy. Okay. 
What I would suggest that you do, uh, first of all, the routine measures, we know just 20 seconds washing hands, we're rid of those viruses. However, if I were in that situation and I had a high level of absenteeism, and I used to do this all the time, the child who had leukemia, the child who was um, immune compromised for any reason, whenever I would see a high level of illness during flu season or um, uh, years ago, we used to get a lot of chicken pox all at once or whatever, I would always call home and tell that parent of the immune suppressed child, listen, half of his class is out now ill. If you wish, keep him home. And this way they are protected. And again, the teacher, if the teacher sees that there's a large number of ill children in that classroom, maybe the teacher should not be there if they're immune uh, compromised. Uh, another question we got was from Jackie, who asked, Janice, do you have resources for babies and toddlers at school nurseries? I work with teen parents and their children. You know, I really don't know that one. Um, I have not heard that babies have, um, uh, they're the target group with this horrible disease, but who knows? I mean, everything is so new yet. Um, I honestly don't know. I would suggest though, they contact the local and state health department and see if they have recommendations. It could be with this, with the virgin group of babies like that, that they may even want to restrict access to um, the, that particular class in the, in the school. I don't, I don't know if they would want to stay in session, you know, if, if the, the, uh, the level continues to rise. Yeah. I, I don't know. I wish I, I it's a good question. I, I can't think of a, a better answer. Um, Jeanette asked the following, is there a site school nurses can use for request of PPE for schools in New Jersey or any state for that matter? I don't know if there's a site for PPE. I think we have to deal with our um, supply catalogs for it. I'm not aware of any one site offering PPEs, it probably would not hurt to ask our, the state organization. You never know, maybe they would even be able to access a bulk supply just to give to school districts. Right. I, think, I, I can't think of any other way to get the supplies. Um, Anne asked a really important uh, question. Upon return to school, how will we know which students should be self-isolating at home after being ill with COVID symptoms? with or without a diagnosis slash positive test. I know that there are community acquired cases in my town from public updates from the mayor, but have not had any notification from the local health department. This is a tough one because we're dealing with privacy issues. And as I said earlier, I'm not sure when we're talking about a major health epidemic like this, if we will see some flexing in our responsibility as far as um, sharing personal information. Um, I would I would be very, very cautious here. The best thing, of course, as I mentioned, is keeping in touch with families. If there is illness there, then you follow through and ask if they have, have um, reported it, if, if they're keeping statistics, if there's any contact that people have to make um, after they've been diagnosed. As far as returning to school, that's something that I think should be consulted with the school doctor. And see, there may be, it may benefit if each person has a physician note coming back to school that they have been cleared, that they fulfilled whatever obligation they have as far as quarantining. Again, I don't know if we can get in between the school doctor and the actual disease and the reporting agency. I don't know what our role will be there, but I know it would certainly not help hurt to have the school nurse um, be in touch with the family and see what's actually going on in that home. And then I'm thinking off the top of my head, the best thing would be to have the school visit, the um, family doctor uh, clear the, st the student to return and then have the school doctor then counter approve. Um, thanks, Janice. We also have a couple questions about ventilation from Melissa and Mary. Um, 
Melissa asked, Janice, would it be beneficial for school nurses to find another health office within the school that has an open window for better, better ventilation? For instance, if the copier room has a window and the health office does not, should it be suggested for a switch? And Mary's question was, what is the best way to ventilate a very small clinic that does not have windows? So what do you recommend in this situation? Okay, absolutely. Every health office should have a window. I mean, it just it just makes sense. And it should be one that works that you can open without calling six men to, to lift for you. Um, of uh, a window that you can open as needed or immediately after that ill child leaves to go home. It's a wonderful idea. Certainly, I would think the nurse's needs are more important than a copy room. I think there should be a move. I would like each nurse that is listening to this to get a mental image of their health office and make sure that they can properly ventilate. I mean, there's fans you could set up, but you put it by the hall and all of that, but you need a window, you need a good exhaust, unless you have um, a very good exhaust system, a central air condition or something like that, absolutely. And then if you could turn up the blower after you've uh, disinfected, that's ideal. But certainly ventilation is important, I would think much more important than a copy machine. All right, so uh, we have time for one more question. And before I give you the question, I just wanna let everybody know because a lot of people have asked about access to this webinar and we will be, um, we will be, we've recorded this webinar and we will distribute it to people because some of you have talked about in the questions about sharing this information with your colleagues and people who were not able to attend. So um, thank you for all those comments and we will follow up with you regarding those. All right, so the, the final question I have, Janice, is are there additional precautions that should be taken when providing with students with severe developmental uh, disabilities and required skilled nursing care, i.e. trait care, G-tubes, catheterizations? Well, I think children, children with those kinds of chronic conditions really are at risk and they and the caregivers are as well i don't know if there's anything additional i mean even the hospital workers now working in the units they um they're wearing masks they're wearing gloves and perhaps a face shield would be a good idea because these children do salivate um that might be an additional help um i don't think anything other than i can't imagine anything more if the caregiver feels better certainly a gown might be helpful um you can go the whole way with it um and just good general hand washing every opportunity you can that's probably the most important thing and of course keeping hands off the face that's great advice janice um, everyone, we've come to the end of the presentation. Um, thank you again, Janice, for your presentation today. The School Nurse Supply for your support and to all of you who took the time to join us today. As I mentioned before, we'll answer your questions that, that haven't been answered already. We appreciate the important role that all of you play in our schools and especially in the lives of children across the country. Thank you so much and have a great rest of the day today. Thank you, Lee, and thank you, colleagues. Thank you.